Alabama yields back. Um, I'll go last. Uh, Ms. Nguyen, uh, I'm one of those too many lawyers my colleagues make reference to from time to time. Um, I'm, I'm not a su subject matter expert um, here or anywhere else, um, but I suspect lots of people that are following this issue and maybe they're watching the hearing aren't subject matter experts either. So I get that all of you are experts and the vernacular just rolls off your tongue, but for lots of people, they don't know what a midnight regulation is. They don't know what the CRA is. They don't know what a guidance document is. So with specific reference to midnight regulations, um, how, if at all, does it impact the CRA? The midnight rulemaking is um, uh, defined by the mandate that, um, in terms of our review, it's defined by a specific period uh, between September 23rd and January 20th. So we were asked, mandated, to look at the midnight rulemaking. Uh, it's referred to that because of that period. And in terms of the CRA, as I noted, um, we found that compliance with CRA for the transition period in comparison to non-transition period is they're about the same. Uh, the trend that's important to note is that compliance with CRA has increased over time. Um, can you tell us which agencies had the highest rate of non-compliance? The two agencies that have the highest rate of non-compliance uh, are HHS and DOT, and EPA has the lowest non-compliance rate. What uh, justification or explanation were offered by the two with the highest rate of non-compliance? Because of the breadth and scope of our work, we were asked to look at non-compliance, the compliance with midnight rulemaking over the course of 20 years for various procedural requirements. So therefore, we, we did not have the opportunity to inquire with those agencies. If, if I may add, we are um, <clears throat> taking steps to um, notify those agencies of their non-compliance to call to their attention their obligations under the Congressional Review Act. So you think it's a matter of oversight rather than intentionality? I wouldn't want to speculate that on that. I don't know. Uh, I really, we haven't looked at that question. Is there a correlation between um, non-compliance and economically significant regulations? Our study shows that uh, economically significant uh, regulations have a non-compliance rate of about 25 percent and 15 percent for significant uh, rules. All right. For those who have never heard the term before, what is a guidance document? Guidance um, are used by agencies to provide timely information to agencies and agencies also use them to convey how they plan to interpret regulations. Um, guidance, generally, um, they're not legally binding. Uh, whenever you use words like generally, it makes me wonder that there's an exception to that. Uh, the exception is what uh, we discussed earlier with the notion that the IRS uh, views their guidance to be authoritative. If I heard uh, Professor Perillo correctly, there's, um, there's no legal force, lay the IRS aside, there's no legal force attached to guidance documents. Is there, um, are there any legal presumptions attached to it, accepting that it doesn't have force of law? Are there certain presumptions attached to guidance documents? I cannot speak about the presumption issue that's um, really from their perspective of the regulated parties. Can I ask your lawyer, is there a legal presumption attached um, in any way with guidance documents? Here's what's vexing me when I hear the professor say, and I'm sure he's right, that it's not intended to have the force of law or for everyone to conform their conduct, that they still want to go by, on a case-by-case -case basis. Whenever I hear the phrase case-by-case, -case, that's just Latin for no guidance. Um, there's no uniformity. If you're going to go case by case, which is what I think I understood him to say, then what is the purpose and or legal effect of guidance documents? 
I believe that um, guidance documents, by definition, are not legally binding on the regulated community. There have been complaints over the years, however, from the regulated community that at times agencies are imposing binding requirements on the regulated community through guidance rather than going through a rulemaking procedure. And I think that's the underlying complaint behind the use of guidance, not where it's used for the purposes for which it's intended, but rather to impose binding requirements that should really be going through a rulemaking process. Will, will the gentleman yield for a, a follow-up question to your point? S certainly. Uh, the, the chairman is spot on, and he's, he's in a line of questioning that, quite frankly, is at the very heart of this hearing, is guidance, typically, uh, and where he's going with this is, does it have any other meaningful effect either through previous jurisprudence or lawsuits where guidance has been used in a way that is, uh, connotates a rule or a regulation instead of just guidance? And I, I think it would be fair to say that there have been complaints that been, guidance has been used to impose requirements that should not have been imposed unless they went through a rulemaking process. I yield, um, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me ask one other question. Is, is there a colorable claim or cause of action if the assertion is that this discretion referenced by Professor Perillo was applied disparately to this group versus that group? Is that a is that a cause of action? Is that a colorable claim from a litigation standpoint that this exercise of discretion was used disparately? Um, I think actually Professor Perillo might be best uh, qualified to answer that question. I'm sure he's written a law review article on it. <laughs> he may direct us to it. On, on the question of whether as I understand your your question, whether inconsistency uh, between individual cases uh, would be subject to a, a judicial challenge. Um, if the context were enforcement, uh, then no, because under Heckler versus Cheney, uh, at least one-off enforcement decisions uh, or decisions not to enforce uh, or to enforce in the first place are not subject to judicial review. Uh, if we move beyond the context of enforcement and we talk about uh, agency adjudication, such as permitting or something like that, um, then if an agency d does not follow the reasoning that it used for a prior individual decision and gives no explanation of why it didn't follow that reasoning, um, then that would be uh, subject to a judicial challenge. So it varies by the type of, uh, uh, by the type of individual proceeding we're talking about. Thank you. A uh, gentleman from Wisconsin. I have all sorts of questions, but I, at the beginning, I'd like to yield to my uh, good friend, Congressman Palmer. Uh, thank the gentleman. I, just very quickly, uh, in that point about 12,000 guidance documents and, and, and only 189 were submitted, there's no place on the GAO, GAO form for meaningfully reporting guidance. Don't you think that, that it would help matters? to have that on the form? And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter this into the record. Um, GAO has issued a number of opinions on whether guidance documents are rules for purpose of the Congressional Review Act. Um, it's up to the agencies to decide when they're issuing guidance whether they have an obligation to comply with respect to the Congressional Review Act with respect to that particular guidance document. Does it meet um, the definition of a rule under the APA? Um, we call them all rules. And when, they're, um, when we're asked to consider whether a particular guidance document is a rule for purposes of the, of the, of the Congressional Review Act, um, at the end of the day, it's a rule, <laughs> well, and and so we call. I, I don't want to take up the gentleman's time. I just think you ought to add that on your reform. It might help get a better response. We'll, so we'll certainly, I think the gentleman uh, yield back. Yeah, uh, just a general.